Whenever there's a big storm near an airport, there's always some pretty cool videos that appear online over the following days of the planes coming in sideways and correcting at the last minute to land on the runway safely. Where does this cool landing force known as wind even come from though? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 11th class in the meteorology series. Today we're going to be taking a look at wind. Wind is vitally important for us day to day as pilots because we need to understand if we're going to exceed any wind limitations that the aircraft might have during takeoff and of course during landing. I'm going to split wind into two classes and in this first class we're going to be taking a look at why wind is formed and in the second class we're going to be taking a look at some typical high level and low level winds that you might experience when you're out about in the world. The primary cause of wind is a pressure difference usually caused by differences in temperature and air will always try to correct this pressure differential by moving from the high pressure towards the lower pressure. So in this simple top-down isobar diagram that we have here, we would say that it flows this way. The air would flow this way at 90 degrees to the isobars. The force behind this air movement is caused by the pressure gradient um, between these isobars. So we call this a pressure gradient force, a PGF for short. And the closer these lines of equal pressure, these isobars were together, then the more severe the gradient would be and therefore the larger the pressure gradient force would be and that means stronger winds. So when you see isobars close together on a chart it means stronger wind because you've got a larger pressure gradient force behind it. On Earth we are spinning at a rate of 360 degrees every day and depending on what latitude you are you will have a different linear speed. So at the equator, you're rotating around the whole length of the equator, so your distance is quite high, but your speed is still the same. So, uh, sorry, and you've got the same amount of time to do it, so your speed is gonna be quite high, linear speed. When we reach a higher, or indeed a lower latitude, we are now only traveling along a small circle, not the full circumference of the equator, but a much smaller uh, distance. So our distance is less, which means that our speed is also less. So say we had a wind that was blowing northwards like this. Then it would start off with a large horizontal force going this way as well. And as we go up and up and up the latitude lines, we get into slower areas um, in terms of their lateral speed. So basically this wind enters into slower and slower area as it travels north. And this has the effect of acting like a brake and stops the wind from traveling in a straight line. And what actually happens is it starts to veer off to the right like this. And as we travel on the Southern Hemisphere, it veers off to the left. In the Northern Hemisphere, this geostrophic force, as it's called, acts perpendicular at 90 degrees of the pressure gradient force. So you would have your pressure gradient force like this, and at 90 degrees to the right of this moving mass of air, you would get the geostrophic force, which is also sometimes known as the Coriolis force or the Coriolis effect. So as we move up the latitude and the Coriolis force is pulling it round, pulling the air around more and more and more, we're no longer gonna be acting at 90 degrees to this pressure gradient force because it's always at 90 degrees to the moving mass of air. So as it gets pulled around, it's still acting at 90 degrees to that. So you would still have your pressure gradient force going this way, but you'd be acting at 90 degrees to the moving mass of air. And eventually you get to the point where they're both balanced out and equal. The geostrophic force or the Coriolis force um, can be calculated using this equation. So two times omega, omega being the rotational speed of the earth, times the density of the air, times the speed of the air that's moving, multiplied by sine of theta, and theta is the latitude. So if you have a higher latitude, aka you're closer to the pole, then you would feel the geostrophic force a lot more. If you're traveling faster, you would feel it a lot more. And if you were more dense air, you would feel it a lot more as well. 
What this geostrophic force means is that we end up with a wind which is known as the geostrophic wind. It has two components to consider. You initially have your pressure gradient force and your geostrophic force. And as I tried to explain in the previous slide, or the previous piece of paper, these aren't slides I suppose, it always acts at 90 degrees to the mass of air that's moving. So initially it starts off because the pressure gradient force is where the air is moving, it acts at 90 degrees. And as it pulls it round, it keeps on acting at 90 degrees to the air. And eventually you end up in the situation where it's that the air is moving completely sideways following the isobars and the pressure gradient force and the geostrophic force are equal and opposite. So you could say that the pressure gradient force is equal to the geostrophic force and this is the equation for the geostrophic force. So everything's all imbalanced and harmonious in the geostrophic wind. So in the northern hemisphere we get pulled to the right by the geostrophic force but if we were in the southern hemisphere you need to remember that we get pulled round to the left. So when the isobars are those straight lines, we consider the pressure gradient force and the geostrophic force when we calculate that geostrophic wind. In reality though, the isobars are very rarely straight lines and are often curved, which means we introduce a centripetal force which acts into the turns and curves of the isobars. And if we consider the geostrophic wind, we know that the pressure, for, pressure gradient force and the geostrophic force are always equal and opposite. And then depending on the direction of the curve, the central force either acts with the pressure gradient force or with the geostrophic force. If we consider a low pressure area, if we have an isobar curving around it, then the pressure gradient force and the central force act together against the geostrophic force. And the result of this is that the gradient wind speed will be slower than the equivalent geostrophic wind speed if these lines were straight. The way I like to think, that I like to think about it is with this diagram down here. So say we have the Coriolis force or the geostrophic force as being a set size because we're at a set latitude. It is this long. And in a geostrophic wind, we are balanced out equally and oppositely by the pressure gradient force, which is like this. If we then add in the curved nature of these isobars, we can add in the centripetal force. And this acts in harmony with the pressure gradient force because we're turning in this way and the centripetal force acts into the curve. So we then have a component of this side that's made up of the centripetal force. So you get the centripetal force plus the pressure gradient force equal to the geostrophic force. And because the geostrophic force is only made up by a part of the pressure gradient force, then the pressure gradient force will be weaker and the pressure gradient force is the driving factor behind how strong winds are. So you have it's equal and opposite, but you only need a smaller amount of pressure gradient force to balance out the geostrophic Coriolis force. So we can also use that concept to understand what happens to the curved gradient wind compared to the geostrophic wind when we look at a high pressure system as well. So when we draw it out in the same sort of way, we can see that on this side, we've got the pressure gradient force we're acting from high to low pressure gradient force coming over this direction. We're pulled around to the right, this is in the northern hemisphere, and we have the geostrophic force opposite and equal. We also have this central force. So we've got the central force plus the geostrophic force now equal to the pressure gradient force, which means that the pressure gradient force is going to be a lot bigger to balance out both of these factors. This means that the pressure gradient force is now stronger than if these lines were straight. So the gradient wind, the curved wind, is now stronger when compared to the geostrophic wind if we have equal spacing of the isobars. So the geostrophic wind and the gradient wind are considered to be outside of the turbulent surface layer, which is known as the friction layer. Inside this layer, geographic features such as mountains and rising thermal air pockets cause a lot of turbulence and therefore a lot of friction. And this is the effect of slowing down the gradient and geostrophic winds when close to the Earth's surface in this friction layer. 
and the closer we are to the surface, the more disruption there's going to be and the slower the wind is as a result. When we add in friction, the strength of the geostrophic force also reduces as our wind speed is going down, so the geostrophic force also goes down. What this means in practice is we have less of a pulling motion, so we don't get pulled around quite as much as we would if we were outside the uh, friction layer. So if you look at this example, say we're in the friction layer on the right and we are not in the friction layer on the left. We get pulled round, pulled round because we're going faster because we're not within this turbulent friction zone and that means that our wind gets diverted. This angle in the end and maybe that's about 250 degrees and let's call it 100 knots. So let's call it 100 knots at 250. Wind is always given is the direction it's blowing from. So on your compass, this is coming from about 250, blowing into this space. When we're within the friction layer, because we are um, slower, that means there is less of this gradient force, so we're pulled around a lot less. And that means what happens is we get a slower wind speed, let's call it 50 knots, and instead of blowing from 250, it's blowing from maybe 230 degrees. We would call this process a backing. We're backing down the angle of the wind. The way to think about backing is it's going backwards on the clock, it's going anti-clockwise. The opposite of this is called veering, so veering would be increasing in size. So when we go down into the friction layer, the wind backs, and as we climb out of the friction layer, it would veer, because the strength of this geostrophic force is increasing as we increase with altitude, and therefore pulling the wind round more. That's the case for the Northern Hemisphere. So in the Northern Hemisphere, as we go down, we back, but in the Southern Hemisphere, as we go down, we veer. And the way that I like to remember it is there's no backing down. You know, there's no backing down from a fight or something like that. And that means that the no, N-O, for the Northern Hemisphere, there's backing down because we're backing the wind direction as we go down. And then I just remember that the Southern Hemisphere is the opposite to that. So the level to which this backing and weakening of the strength of the wind occurs will depend on what is on the surface, basically. And there's some ballpark figures here based on some uh, typical conditions or typical surfaces. So you would get 10 degree backing and 70% strength as you're over the sea during the day. And you would get 30 degree backing and 50% strength if you're over land during the day. And then you would get a 45 degree backing with a 35% strength when you're over land at night. And the reason there's a difference between these two is because at night, this friction layer compresses, everything shrinks together because it's colder. And that means you get a sudden increase of friction near the surface, whereas normally it's quite a gradual increase as we go down, and that means that we get a more pronounced change in direction and strength as we climb up because we're suddenly into the uh, friction-free zone, um, whereas before we're doing a very gradual change down when we're um, over land during the day. So in summary then, the main driving force behind the strength of the wind is the pressure gradient force, and that is the uh, force that is generated by the pressure differential across the isobars. Because of the geostrophic force, or the Coriolis effect, in the Northern Hemisphere, the wind or the moving mass of air is pulled round to the right until eventually we reach the point where we have an equal and opposite pressure gradient force to the geostrophic force. And this means that you could say that the high pressure will always be on the right of the geostrophic wind. That's a nice easy way to remember it. When we consider the geostrophic wind around curved isobars, we then have to add in a centripetal force, and then we call that wind the gradient wind. And the gradient wind will either be stronger or weaker than the geostrophic wind, depending on what is happening, where you're central force is acting. So in the case of a 
wind around a low pressure system, you could say that the gradient wind is now going to be weaker than the equivalent geostrophic wind. And that's because you now don't need as much pressure gradient force, which is the driving factor behind the strength of the wind, because some of your force is coming from the central force generated by these curves. The opposite is true if we're going around a high pressure system. The pressure gradient force will be a lot larger because we are now counteracting both the geostrophic force and the central force. So therefore, the pressure gradient force will have to be larger and therefore stronger. That means the winds are faster and stronger because we're counteracting both. So when we get close to the surface, we're now in the friction layer and that means our wind speed slows down and that means that the geostrophic force slows down because of our lower speed of the wind. What this means in practice is that the uh, wind isn't pulled around as much. So as we descend down into the friction layer in the northern hemisphere, we get the effect of the wind getting pulled around less and that's called backing, the backwards motion of the wind in terms of its clockwise direction, if that makes sense. So it's going backwards around the clock, the numbers are reducing. So we could say in this example, we're blowing from about 200 degrees and the strength would be 100 knots or so. And then as we go down, we're going to go closer and closer to maybe about 185 in this example with a lot slower wind speed. And the way to remember it is there's no back and down in the northern hemisphere, NO, there's no backing down. But in the southern hemisphere, it's opposite. It veers as it goes down. It doesn't increase in strength as it goes down. It's still affected by this speed um, issue, but it just goes to the right as it goes down rather than going to the left in the case of the backing. Some rough ballpark figures for you in terms of the level of this backing and or veering would be 10 degree backing and 70% strength if we're over the sea, a 30 degree backing with 50% strength if we're over the land, and a 45 degree backing with 25% strength if we're over the land, but it's night time. And the reason for this more severe change is because the friction layer compresses and you get a more extreme change of the levels of friction, essentially, whereas during the day, it's quite slow and gradual, so you don't experience the uh, effects of the backing as much.